The Beatrix Potter Giant Treasury by Beatrix Potter. The first story in this book is the story of a fierce bad rabbit. This is a fierce bad rabbit. Look at his savage whiskers and his claws and his turned up tail. This is a nice gentle rabbit. His mother has given him a carrot. The bad rabbit would like some carrot. He doesn't say please. He takes it and he scratches the good rabbit very badly. The good rabbit creeps away and hides in a hole. It feels sad. This is a man with a gun. He sees something sitting on a bench. He thinks it is a very funny bird. He comes creeping up behind the trees and then he shoots. Bang! This is what happens. But this is all he finds on the bench when he rushes up with his gun. The good rabbit peeps out of its hole and it sees the bad rabbit tearing past without any tail or whiskers. The end. Oh, that's kind of a sad story. I don't like animals to get hurt. The story of Miss Moppet. At least he made it out alive, though, even though he is a bad rabbit after all. This is a pussy called Miss Moppet. She thinks she has heard a mouse. This is the mouse peeping out behind the cupboard and making fun of Miss Moppet. He is not afraid of a kitten. This is Miss Moppet jumping just too late. She misses the mouse and hits her own head. She thinks it is a very hard cupboard. The mouse watches Miss Moppet from the top of the cupboard. Miss Moppet ties up her head in a duster and sits before the fire. The mouse thinks she is looking very ill. He comes sliding down the bell pull. Miss Moppet looks worse and worse. The mouse comes a little nearer. Miss Moppet holds her poor head in her paws and looks at him through a hole in the duster. The mouse comes very close. And then, all of a sudden, Miss Moppet jumps upon the mouse. And because the mouse has teased Miss Moppet, Miss Moppet thinks she will tease the mouse, which is not at all nice of Miss Moppet. She ties him up in the duster and tosses it about like a ball. But she forgot about that hole in the duster, and when she untied it, there was no mouse. He has wriggled out and run away, and he is dancing a jig on top of the cupboard. The end. Now let's read about the tale of Tom Kitten. Once upon a time, there were three little kittens, and their names were Mittens, Tom Kitten, and Moppet. They had dear little fur coats of their own, and they tumbled about the doorstep and played in the dust. But one day their mother, Mrs. Tabitha Twitchit, expected friends to tea, so she fetched the kittens indoors to wash and dress them before the fine company arrived. First she scrubbed their faces, this one is Moppet. Then she brushed their fur, this one is Mittens. Then she combed their tails and whiskers, this is Tom Kitten. Tom was very naughty and he scratched. Mrs. Tabitha dressed Moppet and Mittens in clean pinafores and tuckers, and then she took all sorts of elegant, uncomfortable clothes out of a chest of drawers in order to dress up her son, Thomas. Tom Kitten was very fat, and he had grown. Several buttons burst off. His mother sewed them on again. When the three kittens were ready, Mrs. Tabitha unwisely turned them out into the garden to be out of the way while she made hot buttered toast. Now keep your frocks clean, children. You must walk on your hind legs. Keep away from the dirty ash pit and from Sally Henny Penny and from the Piggity and the Puddle Ducks. 
sorry, the pigsty and the puddle ducks. Moppet and Mittens walked down the garden path unsteadily. Presently, they trod upon their pinafores and fell on their noses. When they stood up, there were several green smears. Let us climb up the rockery and sit on the garden wall, said Moppet. They turned their pinafores back to front and went up with a skip and a jump. Moppet's white tucker fell down into the road. Tom Kitten was quite unable to jump when walking upon his hind legs and trousers. He came up the rockery by degrees, breaking the ferns and shedding buttons right and left. He was all in pieces when he reached the top of the wall. Moppet and Mittens tried to pull him together. His hat fell off and the rest of his buttons burst. While they were in difficulties, there was a pit pat paddle pat and the three puddle ducks came along the hard high road marching one behind the other and doing the goose step pit pat paddle pat pit pat waddle pat they stopped and stood in a row and stared up at the kittens they had very small eyes and looked surprised then the two duck birds rebecca and jemima puddle duck picked up the hat and tucker and put them on. Mittens laughed so that she fell off the wall. Moppet and Tom descended after her. The pinafores and all the rest of Tom's clothes came off on the way down. Come, Mr. Drake Puddle... Oh, come, Mr. Drake Puddle Duck, said Moppet. Come and help us to dress him. Come and button up Tom. Mr. Drake Puddle Duck advanced in a slow, sideways manner and picked up the various articles. But he put them on himself. They fitted him even worse than Tom Kitten. It's a very fine morning, said Mr. Drake Puddle Duck. And he and Jemima and Rebecca Puddle Duck set off up the road, keeping step. Pit, pat, paddle, pat. Pat Waddle Pat. Then Tabitha Twitchit came down the garden and found her kittens on the wall with no clothes on. She pulled them off the wall, smacked them, and took them back to the house. My friends will arrive in a minute, and you are not fit to be seen. I am affronted, said Mrs. Tabitha Twitchit. She sent them upstairs, and I am sorry to say she told her friends that they were in bed with the measles which was not true. Quite the contrary, they were not in bed, not in the least. Somehow, there were very extraordinary noises overhead which disturbed the dignity and repose of the tea party. And I think that's, that someday I shall have to make another larger book to tell you more about Tom Kitten. As for the Puddle Ducks, they went into a pond. The clothes all came off directly because there were no buttons, and Mr. Drake, Puddle Duck, and Jemima and Rebecca have been looking for them ever since. The end. And the next story is the tale of Jemima Puddle Duck, a farmyard tale for Ralph and Betsy. That's who this story is dedicated to. What a funny sight it is to see a brood of ducklings with a hen. Listen to the story of Jemima Puddle Duck, who was annoyed because the farmer's wife would not let her hatch her own eggs. Her sister-in-law, Mrs. Rebecca Puddle Duck, was perfectly willing to leave the hatching to someone else. I have not the patience to sit on a nest for 28 days, and no more have you, Jemima. You would let them go cold. You know you would. I wish to hatch my own eggs. I will hatch them all by myself, quacked Jemima Puddle Duck. She tried to hide her eggs, but they were always found and carried off. Jemima Puddle Duck became quite desperate. She determined to make a nest right away from the farm. She set off on a fine spring afternoon along the cart road that leads over the hill. 
She was wearing a shawl and a poke bonnet. When she reached the top of the hill, she saw a wood in the distance. She thought that it looked a safe, quiet spot. Jemima Puddle Duck was not much in the habit of flying. She ran downhill a few yards, flapping her shawl, and then she jumped off into the air. She flew beautifully when she had got a good start. She skimmed along over the treetops until she saw an open place in the middle of the wood where the trees and brushwood had been cleared. Jemima alighted rather heavily and began to waddle about in search of a convenient, dry nesting place. She rather fancied a tree stump amongst some tall foxgloves. But, seated upon the stump, she was startled to find an elegantly dressed gentleman reading a newspaper. He had black prick ears and sandy-colored whiskers. Quack, said Jemima Puddle Duck with her head and her bonnet on one side. Quack. The gentleman raised his eyes above his newspaper and looked curiously at Jemima. Madam, have you lost your way, said he. He had a long bushy tail which he was sitting upon as the stump was somewhat damp. Jemima thought him mighty civil and handsome. She explained that she had not lost her way but that she was trying to find a convenient dry nesting place. Ah, is that so? Indeed, said the gentleman with sandy whiskers looking curiously at Jemima. He folded up the newspaper and put it in his coat tail pocket. Jemima complained of the superfluous hen. Indeed, how interesting. I wish I could meet with that fowl. I would teach it to mind its own business. But as to a nest, there is no difficulty. I have a sack full of feathers in my woodshed. No, my dear madam, you will be in nobody's way. You may sit there as long as you like, said the bushy, long-tailed gentleman, he led the way to a very retired, dismal-looking house amongst the foxgloves. It was built of faggots and turf, and there were two broken pails, one on top of another, by way of a chimney. This is my summer residence. You would not find my earth, my winter house, so convenient, said the hospitable gentleman. There was a tumble-down shed at the back of the house made of old soap boxes. The gentleman opened the door and showed Jemima in. The shed was almost quite full of feathers. It was almost suffocating, but it was comfortable and very soft. Jemima Puddle Duck was rather surprised to find such a vast quantity of feathers, but it was very comfortable and she made a nest without any trouble at all. When she came out, the sandy-whiskered gentleman was sitting on a log reading the newspaper. At least he had it spread out, but he was looking over the top of it. He was so polite that he seemed almost sorry to let Jemima go home for the night. He promised to take great care of her nest until she came back again next day. He said he loved eggs and ducklings. He should be proud to see a fine nest full in his woodshed. Jemima Puddle Duck came every afternoon. She laid nine eggs in the nest. They were greeny white and very large. The foxy gentleman admired them immensely. He used to turn them over and count them when Jemima was not there. At last, Jemima told him that she intended to begin to sit next day. And I will bring a bag of corn with me so that I never leave my nest until the eggs are hatched. They might catch cold, said the conscientious Jemima. Madam, I beg you not to trouble yourself with a bag. I will provide oats. But before you commence your tedious sitting, I intend to give you a treat. Let us have a dinner party all to ourselves. May I ask you to bring up some herbs from the farm garden to make a savory omelet? Sage and thyme and mint and two onions and some parsley. I will provide lard for the stuff, lard for the omelet said the hospitable gentleman with sandy whiskers. Jemima Puddle Duck was a simpleton. Not even the mention of sage and onions made her suspicious. She went round the farm garden, nibbling off snippets of all the different sorts of herbs that are used for stuffing roast duck. And she waddled into the kitchen and got two onions out of a basket. 
The collie dog, Kep, met her coming out. What are you doing with those onions? Where do you go every afternoon by yourself, Jemima Puddle Duck? Jemima was rather in awe of the collie. She told him the whole story. The collie listened with his wise head on one side. He grinned when she described the polite gentleman with sandy whiskers. He asked several questions about the wood and about the exact position of the house and shed. Then he went out and trotted down the village. He went to look for two foxhound puppies who were out at walk with the butcher. Jemima Puddle Duck went up the cart road for the last time on a sunny afternoon. She was rather burdened with bunches of herbs and two onions in a bag. She flew over the wood and alighted opposite the house of the bushy, long-tailed gentleman. He was sitting on a log. He sniffed the air and kept glancing uneasily round the wood. When Jemima alighted, he quite jumped. Come into the house as soon as you have looked at your eggs. Give me the herbs for the omelette. Be sharp. He was rather abrupt. Jemima Puddle Duck had never heard him speak like that. She felt surprised and uncomfortable. While she was inside, she heard pattering feet round the back of the shed. Someone with a black nose sniffed at the bottom of the door and then locked it. Jemima became much alarmed. A moment afterward, there were most awful noises, barking, baying, growls and howls, squealing and groans, and nothing more was ever seen of that foxy whiskered gentleman. Presently, Kep opened the door of the shed and let out Jemima Puddle Duck. Unfortunately, the puppies rushed in and gobbled up all the eggs before he could stop them. He had a bite on his ear and both the puppies were limping. Jemima Puddle Duck was escorted home in tears on account of those eggs. She laid some more in June and she was permitted to keep them herself, but only four of them hatched. Jemima Puddle Duck said that it was because of her nerves, but she had always been a bad sitter. The Roly-Poly Pudding Once upon a time, there was an old cat called Mrs. Tabitha Twitchit, who was an anxious parent. She used to lose her kittens continually, and whenever they were lost, they were always in mischief. On baking day, she determined to shut them up in a cupboard. She caught Moppet and Mittens, but she could not find Tom. Mrs. Tabitha went up and down all over the house, mewing for Tom Kitten. She looked in the pantry under the staircase, and she searched the best spare bedroom that was all covered up with dust sheets. She went right upstairs and looked into the attics, but she could not find him anywhere. It was an old, old house full of cupboards and passages. Some of the walls were four feet thick, and there used to be queer noises inside them, as if there might be a little secret staircase. Certainly there were odd little jagged doorways in the wainscot, and things disappeared at night, especially cheese and bacon. Mrs. Tabitha became more and more distracted and mewed dreadfully. While their mother was searching the house, Moppet and Mittens had got into mischief. The cupboard door was not locked, so they pushed it open and came out. They went straight to the dough, which was set to rise in a pan before the fire. They patted it with their little soft paws. Shall we make dear little muffins? said Mittens to Moppet. But just at that moment, somebody knocked at the front door and Moppet jumped into the flour barrel in a fright. Mittens ran away to the dairy and hid in an empty jar on the stone shelf where the milk pans stand. The visitor was a neighbor, Mrs. Ribby. She had called to borrow some yeast. Mrs. Tabitha came downstairs mewing dreadfully. Come in, Cousin Ribby. Come in and, and sit ye down. I'm in sad trouble, Cousin Ribby, said Tabitha, shedding tears. I've lost my dear son, Thomas. I'm afraid the rats have got him. She wiped her eyes with her apron. He's a bad kitten, Cousin Tabitha. He made a cat's cradle of my best bonnet last time I came to tea. Where have you looked for him? All over the house. 
The rats are too many for me. What a thing it is to have an unruly family, said Mrs. Tabitha Twitchit. I'm not afraid of rats. I will help you to find him and whip him too. What is all that soot in the fender? The chimney wants sweeping. Oh, dear me, Cousin Ribby. Now Moppet and Mittens are gone. They have both got out of the cupboard. Ribby and Tabitha set to work to search the house thoroughly again. They poked under the beds with Ribby's umbrella, and they rummaged in cupboards. They even fetched a candle and looked inside a, clo a clothes chest in one of the attics. They could not find anything, but once they heard a door bang and somebody scuttered downstairs. Yes, it is infected with rats, said Tabitha tearfully. I caught seven young ones out of the one hole in the back kitchen, and we had them for dinner last Saturday. And once I saw the old father rat, an enormous old rat, Cousin Ribby. I was just going to jump upon him when he showed his yellow teeth at me and whisked down the hole. The rats get upon my nerves, Cousin Ribby, said Tabitha. Ribby and Tabitha searched and searched. They both heard a curious roly-poly noise under the attic floor. But there was nothing to be seen. They returned to the kitchen. Here's one, here's one of your kittens at least, said Ribby, dragging Moppet out of the flour barrel. They shook the flour off her and set her down on the kitchen floor. She seemed to be in a terrible fright. Oh, mother, mother, said Moppet. There's been an old woman rat in the kitchen and she's stolen some of the dough. The two cats ran to look at the dough pan. Sure enough, there were marks of little scratching fingers and a lump of dough was gone. Which way did she go, Moppet? But Moppet had been too much frightened to peep out of the barrel again. Ribby and Tabitha took her with them to keep her safely in sight while they went on with their search. They went into the dairy. The first thing they found was Mittens, hiding in an empty jar. They tipped over the jar and she scrambled out. Oh, mother, mother, said Mittens. Oh, mother, mother, there has been an old man rat in the dairy. A dreadful, enormous, big rat, mother, and he's stolen a pat of butter and the rolling pin. Ribby and Tabitha looked at one another. A rolling pin and butter? Oh, my poor son, Thomas, exclaimed Tabitha, wringing her paws. A rolling pin, said Ribby. Did we not hear a roly-poly noise in the attic when we were looking into that chest? Ribby and Tabitha rushed upstairs again. Sure enough, the roly-poly noise was still going on quite distinctly under the attic floor. This is serious, Cousin Tabitha, said Ribby. We must send for John Joyner at once with a saw. Now, this is what had been happening to Tom Kitten, and it shows how very unwise it is to go up a chimney in a very old house where a person does not know his way and where there are enormous rats. Tom Kitten did not want to be shut up in a cupboard. When he saw that his mother was going to bake, he determined to hide. He looked about for a nice convenient place and he fixed upon the chimney. The fire had only just been lighted and it was not hot, but there was a white choky smoke from the green sticks. Tom Kitten got upon the fender and looked up. It was a big old-fashioned fireplace. The chimney itself was wide enough inside for a man to stand up and walk about, so there was plenty of room for a little tomcat. He jumped right up into the fireplace, balancing himself upon the iron bar where the kettle hangs. Tom Kitten took another big jump off the bar and landed on a ledge high up inside the chimney, knocking down some soot into the fender. Tom Kitten coughed and choked with the smoke, he could hear the sticks beginning to crackle and burn in the fireplace down below. He made up his mind to climb right to the top and get out on the slates and try to catch sparrows. I cannot go back. If I slipped, I might fall in the fire and singe my beautiful tail in my little blue jacket. 
The chimney was a very big old-fashioned one. It was built in the days when people burnt logs of wood upon the hearth. The chimney stack stood above the roof like a little stone tower, and the daylight shone down from the top under the slanting slates that kept out the rain. Tom Kitten was getting very frightened. He climbed up and up and up. Then he waded sideways through inches of soot. He was like a little sweep himself. It was, it was most confusing in the dark. One flue seemed to lead into another. There was less smoke, but Tom Kitten felt quite lost. He scrambled up and up, but before he reached the chimney top, he came to a place where somebody had loosened a stone in the wall. There were some mutton bones lying about. This seems funny, said Tom Kitten. Who has been gnawing bones up here in the chimney? I wish I had never come. And what a funny smell! It is something like mouse, only dreadfully strong. It makes me sneeze, said Tom Kitten. He squeezed through the hole in the wall and dragged himself along a most uncomfortably tight passage where there was scarcely any light. He groped his way carefully for several yards. He was at the back of the, of the skirting board in the attic where there is a little mark in the picture. All at once, he fell head over heels in the dark down a hole and landed on a heap of very dirty rags. When Tom Kitten picked himself up and looked about him, he found himself in a place that he had never seen before, although he had lived all his life in the house. It was a very small, stuffy, fusty room with boards and rafters and cobwebs and lath and plaster. Opposite to him, as far away as he could sit, was an enormous rat. What do you mean by tumbling into my bed all covered with smuts? said the rat, chattering his teeth. Please, sir, the chimney wants sweeping, said poor Tom Kitten. Anna! Maria! Anna! Maria! squeaked the rat. There was a pattering noise and an old woman rat poked her head round a rafter. All in a minute, she rushed upon Tom Kitten, and before he knew what was happening, his coat was pulled off, and he was rolled up in a bundle and tied with string in very hard knots. Anna Maria did the tying. The old rat watched her and took snuff. When she had finished, they both sat staring at him with their mouths open. Anna Maria, said the old man rat, whose name was Samuel Whiskers. Anna Maria? Make me a kitten dumpling roly-poly pudding for my dinner. It requires dough and a pat of butter and a rolling pin, said Anna Maria, considering Tom Kitten with her head on one side. No, said Samuel Whiskers. Make it properly, Anna Maria, with breadcrumbs. Nonsense! Butter and dough, replied Anna Maria. The two rats consulted together for a few minutes and then went away. Samuel Whiskers got through a hole in the wainscot and went boldly down the front staircase to the dairy to get the butter. He did not meet anybody. He made a second journey for the rolling pin. He pushed it in front of him with his paws like a brewer's man trundling a barrel. He could hear Ribby and Tabitha talking, but they were too busy lighting the candle to look into the chest. They did not see him. Anna Maria went down by way of the skirting board and a window shutter to the kitchen to steal the dough. She borrowed a small saucer and scooped up the dough with her paws. She did not observe Moppet. While Tom Kitten was left alone under the floor of the attic, he wriggled about and tried to mew for help, but his mouth was full of soot and cobwebs and he was tied up in such very tight, tight knots he could not make anybody hear him, except a spider who came out of a crack in the ceiling and examined the knots critically from a safe distance. It was a judge of knots because it had a habit of tying up unfortunate blue bottles. It did not offer to assist him. Tom Kitten wriggled and squirmed until he was quite exhausted. Presently, the rats came back and set to work to make him into a dumpling. First they smeared him with butter, and then they rolled him in the dough. 
Will not the string be very indigest indigestible, Anna Maria? inquired Samuel Whiskers. Anna Maria said she thought that it was of no consequence, but she wished that Tom Kitten would hold his head still as it disarranged the pastry. She laid hold of his ears. Tom Kitten bit and spit and mewed and wriggled, and the rolling pin went roly-poly, roly-poly, roly. The rats each held an end. His tail is sticking out. You did not fetch enough dough, Anna Maria. I fetched as much as I could carry, replied Anna Maria. I do not think, said Samuel Whiskers, pausing to take a look at Tom Kitten. I do not think it will be a good pudding. It smells sooty. Anna Maria was about to argue the point when all at once there began to be other sounds up above. The rasping noise of a saw and the noise of a little dog scratching and yelping. The rats dropped the rolling pin and listened attentively. We are discovered and interrupted. Oh, we are discovered and interrupted, Anna Maria. Let us collect our property and other people's and depart at once. I fear that we shall be obliged to leave this pudding. But I am persuaded that the knots would have proved indigestible, whatever you may urge to the contrary. Come away at once and help me to tie up some mutton bones in a counterpane, said Anna Maria. I, I have got half a smoked ham hidden in the chimney. So it happened that by the time John Joyner had got the plank up, there was nobody under the floor except the rolling pin and Tom Kitten in a very dirty dumpling. But there was a strong smell of rats, and John Joyner spent the rest of the morning sniffing and whining and wagging his tail and going round and round with his head in the hole like a gimlet. Then he nailed the plank down again and put his tools in his bag and came downstairs. The cat family had quite recovered. They invited him to stay to dinner. The dumpling had been peeled off Tom Kitten and made separately into a bag pudding, with currants in it to hide the smuts. They had been obliged to put Tom Kitten into a hot bath to get the butter off. John Joyner smelt the pudding, but he regretted that he had not time to stay to dinner because he had just finished making a wheelbarrow for Miss Potter, and she had ordered two hen coops. And when I was going to the post late in the afternoon, I looked up the lane from the corner and I saw Mr. Samuel Whiskers and his wife on the run with big bundles on a little wheelbarrow, which looked very like mine. They were just turning in at the gate to the barn of Farmer Potatoes. Samuel Whiskers was puffing and out of breath. Anna Maria was still arguing in shrill tones. She seemed to know her way and she seemed to have a quantity of luggage. I am sure I never gave her leave to borrow my wheelbarrow. They went into the barn and hauled their parcels with a bit of string to the top of the haymow. After that, there were no more rats for a long time at Tabitha Twitchett's. As for Farmer Potatoes, he has been driven nearly distracted. There are rats and rats and rats in his barn. They eat up the chicken food and steal the oats and bran and make holes in the meal bags. And they are all descended from Mr. and Mrs. Samuel Whiskers. Children and grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren. There is no end to them. Moppet and Mittens have grown up into very good rat catchers. They go out rat catching in the village and they find plenty of employment. They charge so much a dozen and earn their living very comfortably. They hang up the rat's tail in a row on the the rat's tails in a row on the barn door to show how many they have caught, dozens and dozens of them. But Tom Kitten has always been afraid of a rat. He never durst face anything that is bigger than a mouse. The end. Thanks for listening, everyone. Don't forget to check out my Patreon. Bye.